I'll touch briefly on identity fraud. And before I start, uh, I want to say the most obvious thing uh, is that innovation in financial industry is continuous, rapid, so on and so forth. However, I have to state this obvious thing because uh, with each advancement in financial industry, we have advancements in fraud. So uh, actually, uh, no matter your size, uh, uh, any financial institution is susceptible to fraud. Uh, let's first consider traditional financial institutions. So they are the ones that have proper procedures and so on. However, once fraudsters shift their methodologies, uh, traditional financial institutions uh, may face a burden of overcoming their own bureaucracy to implement uh, changes to their procedures so that they can address uh, such fraud. Now, uh, uh, if we look at uh, fintechs, and especially uh, fintech startups, they are much more flexible. They can adapt and change fairly quickly. However, uh, what I saw from my own experience is that sometimes fintechs uh, uh, charge to market too fast, and uh, which causes uh, some lapses in compliance or cybersecurity. And uh, this actually creates uh, a fairly good environment for identity fraud. And today I want to touch on two types of uh, uh, frauds, uh, which are synthetic identity fraud and uh, biometric identity fraud. So let's start with synthetic identity fraud. So if your onboarding process does not have um, in-person verifications or biometric checks, you're basically subjected to synthetic identity fraud. And uh, this type of fraud is currently one of the most pervasive types of frauds in the United States, with average loss per case about $15,000. Now, there are no backstops for such fraud in EU. That's why I'm, uh, I want to talk about this in more detail. So first, uh, what is a synthetic identity? And I'll just jump to another slide. So a synthetic identity is a combination of real and fabricated credentials where individual identifiers are not associated with any single person. All right, so it's a huge sentence here, but they, let, let's just briefly talk how it works. So let's say I have um, a, a valid uh, taxpayer identification number, or let's say simply personal code. It may be valid, it may appear valid, doesn't really matter. Then, once I have this uh, number, and I'll talk later uh, about where to get it, uh, uh, I can open, let's say, a phone number. I can set up uh, my uh, address, or I can use somebody else's address. Then I can use somebody else's name. And then I combine this all stuff into one synthetic identity. Now, what's important is that uh, pretty much every part of this data is valid. It's true data. And if you go and check at the registries, it will basically be validated. Because how usually public registries work is that you ask whether this uh, social security number uh, is uh, valid. And they say, yeah, it's valid. But it doesn't give you any information about that. So how does the whole synthetic identity fraud work? So I'll just put, uh, point out four steps on how to commit it. So first, uh, you, do not, you don't need to be involved. Like, uh, you hear about those big data breaches where you know, such companies as Sony, Facebook, Instagram have their uh, user account data leaked. And I, you know, it, it's even a joke sometimes. I'm like, Facebook, like, I mean, which one? Like, uh, there have been so many uh, leaks that you, know, you, you lose track. Now, during those leaks, everything is leaked about their accounts, about user accounts. Uh, there can be photos, there can be names, addresses, uh, taxpayer identification numbers, and so on. So first the data leaks occurs, and then that data is bought and sold on the dark web. So you know, like uh, uh, my peers talked about uh, deep web today, so I'm not going to expand there, but basically uh, there is a seller and there will be a buyer. So a buyer or a fraudster comes in, buys some data, and uh, creates a synthetic identity, just as I told in the previous slide. He combines that uh, individual identifiers. And then once he has uh, a new synthetic identity, a multiple synthetic identities, he can go to the last step. He then goes to uh, many uh, financial institutions and tries to open an account. It will not happen fast. Like He may even have to apply to 20, 30. Doesn't really matter. But what he needs is that at least a single one opens him an account. 
When he opens an account, then he has possibilities to uh, apply for a loan and whatnot. Once he applies for a loan, if he gets a loan, he takes the money and he disappears. Now, some may even take this fraud you know, more seriously. What they do is they actually open an account and then use it for some time responsibly, uh, build up their credit score and history, and they apply for a bigger loan and they scam you out of uh, more money. And now the true danger of this type of fraud is that because synthetic identity is used, there is no uh, consumer victim. So that may be a good thing, but the problem is that consumers are the ones that complain. So if something goes wrong, consumer will come, uh, uh, come to you and say, hey, like something happened, somebody stole my money. Well, in this case, only the financial institution is at loss. So it is really hard to catch someone who doesn't exist. And even the most advanced technological uh, methods fail at catching synthetic identities. Like if we look at machine learning, even though it has a lot of applications here, it fails. So for example, consider supervised machine learning. You need to train a model that, you can, that it can use later on to catch uh, uh, your fraudsters. But the idea is there's so little uh, cases that were uncovered in synthetic fraud that you have no models on how to train the uh, machine learning models. If you consider unsupervised machine learning here, well, the problem here is that at the point at the, of the application, there is no anomaly in the data. Uh, basically, synthetic identity would look exactly the same as uh, real identity used uh, to open an account. So, uh, what to do? So this is a complex problem and it requires a complex solution. And the complex solution would be that uh, financial institutions would have to go even go into even deeper uh, searches of what their client uh, uh, does and is. So they really need to know their customer. They need to examine uh, whatever data evidences that they can find about this customer because real person leaves traces of his existence. So for example, I myself, I have a LinkedIn account, <coughs> I have a Facebook account, I have an Instagram account, and these traits are hard to fake. You know, If you just made up an identity which has nothing in the web about it, so it may indicate that something is wrong. Now I want to switch my focus to biometric identity fraud. And I said previously that you are exposed to synthetic identity fraud if you have no biometric checks. Now, uh, biometrics are creeping up everywhere. And many in the finan in, uh, financial industry and cybersecurity feel that this is the next big wave of consumer protections just because uh, biometrics are uh, intrinsic part of you. They're part of you and they cannot be easily faked or stolen. They should be used instead of traditional passwords which can be guessed or hacked and so on. But is this technology really foolproof? So I want to ask a question. Can your biometrics be stolen? Probably not. Well, unless somebody chops off your hand or does all kinds of bad things, but uh, they can be easily copied or faked. Now, let's first talk about copying part. Now, uh, biometrics are measurable characteristics and can be handled or mishandled just as any other data. So even though it's fairly hard to steal your biometrics, it's fairly easy to hack your biometrics database, especially if uh, the database is poorly secured, if it is hold, held by some unknown company or something like that. Now, you have to keep in mind that biometric data is way more vulnerable than any other kind of data. For example, if you, somebody leaks your password, uh, no problem, I'll, I'll just change my password. How are you going to change your biometrics? Well, maybe unless, unless you're very rich, you can, I don't know, get, 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 get a face job, you know, do something like that, but uh, in the usual case, if you lose your biometrics, uh, biometric data, uh, there's no way to recover it, and you may, be <coughs> you may lose your access for good. Now, let's switch to faking part. Can we fake biometrics? Well, let's first think about fingerprints. Can we fake them? We usually hear that fingerprints are unique, right? Yeah, they are unique, but they're not that unique. I mean, people can have similar fingerprints. 
And uh, in some cases, people may even have fingerprints that are similar to many people's fingerprints. And those are called master prints. So basically, master print is a fingerprint can, that can be matched to many different fingerprints. So uh, what would happen is that, for example, I have my fingerprints, but at least I can unlock 70% of the mobile phones here. And I would have a unique fingerprint. Knowing that, people did some studies and came up with synthetic fingerprints. Uh, what that means is that they create a fingerprint synthetically that can uh, crack fingerprint recognition systems. Now, and here you see a couple of graphs that show the results of those synthetic master fingerprints. So if you use a regular fingerprint reader, basically 70% of the time they can hack your uh, fingerprint recognition system. And if you have a very strict fingerprint recognition system, still about 20% of the time they will be able to hack it. Now the cool thing is that they even look realistic. So if you have a 3D printer, you can print it on film, add to your finger, and use for practical purposes. Now, can we fake your facial features? We can actually print your face. Uh, Dutch Consumer Club uh, found out that about 40% of the smart smartphones that he tested were able to be unlocked by simply using a printed photo of the owner. And you know, big brands such as Huawei, Samsung, Sony, Xiaomi failed the test. But you know, uh, Forbes did even more elaborate experiment. For just over 300 euros, they 3D printed their head. And uh, all Android smartphones they tested recognized it as, a, as an owner. And let's see that head. Right, with the slightly harder facial recognition, it's a slower version of facial recognition, so it should be more secure. And um, I'll try it with my normal face. Unlocks fairly quickly, so when I try it with the, the fake head. And that's unlocked. So with the softer light, for some reason, the head seems to work even on the strongest facial recognition. Cool, right? Now, I guess an uh, even more sophisticated way to fake your facial features is a deep fake video. Now, currently, deep fakes are basically used for jokes like replacing uh, all uh, characters in the TV series with Mike Tyson. However, this video illustrates the possible dangers that they have. We're entering an era in which our enemies can make it look like anyone is saying anything at any point in time, even if they would never say those things. So, uh, for instance, they could have me say things like, uh, I don't know, uh, Killmonger was right, or, uh, Ben Carson is in the sunken place. Or, how about this, simply, President Trump is a total and complete dipshit. Now, you see, I would never say these things, at least not in a public address, but someone else would. Someone like Jordan Peele. This is a dangerous time. Moving forward, we need to be more vigilant with what we trust from the internet. It's a time when we need to rely on trusted news sources. It may sound basic, but how we move forward in the age of information is going to be the difference between whether we survive or whether we become some kind of fucked up dystopia. Thank you. And stay woke, bitches. Funny man. Uh... Well, like, like, like I said, it's just a joke, but, but the idea is that give it a couple of years, technology will advance, and you will be able to render a deep fake on a live video. So you'll be chatting with somebody on FaceTime, and, that, and you will have no idea whom you're speaking with. So how about voice or iris scans? Well, actually, pretty much anything can be faked. Like if you consider voice, there already are software and hardware that can imitate uh, anybody else's voice, but even if you are good at, Im uh, at impersonating someone, just as that guy uh, that was in the video, you can pass uh, voice recognition. Now, how about our eyes? You know, uh, in the movies, it's one of the most sophisticated things. You know, you have to scan the eye and, and, and whatnot. But the idea is that, like, your eyes are always visible. If I take a selfie with you, I already have a, a copy of your eye. So, you know, it's also not a solution. 
So how do we stay ahead of uh, biometrics fraud? Well, advice for individuals, choose where you use your biometrics. You know, it may be funny uh, to know how you look uh, when you will be old, or how about that red haircut? But you know, like, maybe you shouldn't do that, because somebody else may find that information very useful. Now, advice for companies is invest in security and choose your third-party vendors very wisely. And you know, like, don't go for the lowest price or for the fanciest of presentations. Speak with those who understand what they're talking about, know their strengths, and know their limitations. So, um, as for my presentation, I'm about to be done. So, if you have any questions, I, I will welcome them.